Welcome everybody and oh, <laughs> welcome everybody and thank you for uh, joining us this evening. We're very pleased to have Claire Morrison uh, presenting on taking control of your performance anxiety. Uh, this is, as you probably know, an ongoing series of educational programs, virtual educational programs sponsored by the Indiana Dressage Society. I'd like to make sure that I give an extra special uh, call out to the IDS Education Committee, uh, Mike Dawson, our president, and Barb Levy, Bonham McHouston, Michelle Sirocco, Deb Rockefort, and Linda Kimball. Um, all these people work very hard to come up with ideas and implement um, educational programs of various types for our members. So there's some ground rules I want everybody to pay attention to. Uh, one that I didn't really um, uh, focus on as much as I probably should have, and that is um, when you are signed up and you, and you have your name on the screen, please make sure your name is there and not John's iPad, because we'd like to know who you are so we can keep in touch with you. And if we have any information, we can pass it on to you. Um, so that's really important. So please change your name if you haven't done so. Um, we're gonna mute everybody so there's no audio interference because sometimes you get dogs in the background barking and things like that. Um, if you have a question, you can either hold your question till the end or you can place it, uh, you can raise your hand or you can put it into the comments section and we will address those in the Q&A session at the end of the presentation. Uh, we will be uh, recording this, however, but we ask that you not record it. So we'll take care of the recording. So today, we're going to be hearing from Claire Morrison. Claire is a popular and successful performance coach who helps adult amateurs and collegiate athletes get out of their own way to create peak performance at every level. Claire's undergraduate degree in psychobiology provided her with an excellent foundation in neurology, physiology, biochemistry, and psychology of the high-performance athlete. Her practical experience comes from parenting a Division I athlete and being a nationally competitive equestrian athlete herself. And for those who don't know, it's in dressage. Claire earned her coaching credentials from the International Coaching Federation and uses research-validated mind-body techniques such as heart math and emotional freedom techniques to help her athletes harness their physical, mental, emotional, and spiritual gifts to become resilient, elite athletes. Today, we have some learning objectives. One is to identify that at the end of this program, Claire hopes that, and I hope, that we'll all be able to identify the physical, mental, and emotional aspects of performance anxiety. Also, we'll be able to recognize the impact that, the, that our physical um, body has on this anxiety and their athletic performance. From a mental perspective, understanding of self-talk, one, one of the biggest components of performance anxiety. And on the emotional side, apply a celebration process that acts upon the pattern interrupt to help, their, help athletes' energy, motivation, and joy of their performance. So, Pay attention to those and hopefully we'll be able to be much better informed at the end of this presentation. Now, what I'd like to do is turn it over to Claire. Claire, it's all yours. Awesome, thank you. So Mike has a little, um, Mike's gonna be running my slides for me graciously and um, has uh, a little, uh, just a title, title page for us. Um, and I just want to say I have some notes here that I will you will see me looking and referring to. I love talking about this stuff. So it's just really to keep me on track and make sure I don't go down a cul-de-sac or, you know, get too engaged in answering a question or something like that. So you will occasionally see me looking around. I will ask you to participate um, in the chat. So um, please help me out that way. And um, let's let's get going. So Mike, if you want to throw up that next slide, that would be awesome. Um, so this is a really provocative statement here, right? That four out of five of your thoughts are negative, okay? Let me give you a little context for that. 
you have between 12,000 and 60,000 thoughts or subvocalizations a day. And 95% of them are the same thoughts you had yesterday and are the same thoughts you're gonna have tomorrow. And of those 95% that are repeated, 80% of them, four out of five, are negative. Okay, so that's sort of our baseline about what's going on in our brains. So have you ever felt just, you know, sort of on the anxious side, you know, rapid, shallow breathing? We're so anxious that you've actually like frozen in place. Or been so anxious that you're nauseous or like felt like your thoughts are so scattered that you can't put a sentence together or you can't figure out what's next. Or as you'll see in my story, you know, like you just want to barricade yourself safely in the bathroom, not come out. Sometimes people get so concerned about failing that, you, that they don't even try. So these are all different ways that anxiety might show up on tilt, right? And given the, this important role that anxiety plays in disrupting your performance, if if I, or may just play in disrupting your performance, if I could show you something that you're doing without even knowing it, that keeps you in this sort of anxiety cul-de-sac, I'm hoping that that'll be helpful, right? I am here to help you begin to take control of your performance anxiety so that you can have more fun and perform to the best of your ability. So as a rule follower, I thought that my writing success was solely tied to my physical ability. And I was truly surprised when debilitating anxiety ended my horse showing career. I felt incompetent, humiliated, and like I was a disappointment to myself and others, you know, my husband, my trainer. And some of the thoughts, some of those four out of five negative thoughts, these are all negative. This is a lot of time and money to waste right? Why can't I remember what my trainer just told me before I went into the ring? Who do I think I am? I'm not cut out for this. I don't belong here. All those things going through your head. So let's start with a definition of anxiety. My can you put up that next slide? And then um, I, you can take it down because uh, I, you guys get to look at my beautiful face because there's a number of places where I'm going to be demonstrating things. So with this um, definition of anxiety, let's use that slide for a minute, Mike. Um, a feeling, it's a feeling of worry. Now this is, this is the Google dictionary, not a medical definition of anxiety, okay? Um, but this feeling of worry or nervousness or unease, typically about an imminent event or something with an uncertain outcome. So let's look at that uncertain outcome part for a moment, because that is the definition of competition, right? You have put yourself in this situation with an uncertain outcome. And anxiety sort of is designed to recognize things that are new a little bit, right? So that's, that's a normal, normal response. You put yourself in a situation that's new and, and your body recognizes it. And that is an evolutionarily uh, positive trait, right? Kept us alive. <laughs> so just remember this, this definition. We will come back to it again, okay? All right, you can drop that now, Mike. <clears throat> and so... Hit, hit uh, your chat for me, if you will. Um, how, how is anxiety mostly showing up for you? You know, you're just nervous, a little nervous, like I feel a little over-caffeinated sometimes, right? Do you overthink or over-prepare? Are you afraid to disappoint yourself or others? Maybe you don't perform as well in competition as in practice. 
I usually think of every possible, yes, I call that catastrophizing, every possible negative result. And given that four out of five of your thoughts are negative, you, you, you're probably going to be getting four to one if you even get one positive, right? So <laughs> thanks for sharing that. So over-prepare and exhaust yourself. Yes, yes. Anybody else want to share there? Okay, so what's, what puts that feeling of worry or nervousness or unease, which is just sort of caution, right? But that's anxiety. On tilt, oh, you do the opposite of what you practice. Very interesting. So what puts those those sort of low level anxiety wor or worry. Oh, it surprises you. Nice. Okay. On tilt. It's, it's the self-talk. It's those four out of five thoughts that are not nice. Right? You, you in this case where, where, where Deb just said that she gets surprised by it. And then you're like, oh my God, what's going on, right? And there must be, something must really be dangerous, right? <laughs> yes, working yourself up about it. And that's, that's what we're gonna see as we work through this about how all of these, uh, the mental, emotional, physical, and spiritual all work together. Um, set the bar really low, yeah. So I want to emphasize here that I am going to sort of interchangeably use thoughts and self-talk and um, the notion of the inner critic who is saying those things. Um, so if I use, those, I will use those terms sort of interchangeably. Um, and as we've seen from the chat and from what I've shared so far, Performance anxiety sort of exists on a spectrum, right? Rate, you know, ranging from, you know, just a little nervousness or shallow breathing, right? All the way to an inability to perform or choking, as it's commonly called in professional sports, right? So if you do a quick Google search on famous athletes who choked, I, I did this and it, it gives you a list the top 20 superstar chokes of all time. Now, of course, you can go do this afterwards if you want. Right now, there are no riders on this list, probably just because riding is not that popular support. But let me tell you that they are individual sports. They are team sports. This happens to men and women in golf baseball, basketball, skateboarding, speed skating, snowboarding, tennis, okay? It happens everywhere. But my favorite, favorite example on this list <clears throat> is the 2006 U.S. Open. And for those of you who don't live with my husband, Andy Morrison, the U.S. Open is a major golf championship. And Phil Mickelson was about to win his third straight major championship. Okay, all he had to do was par the last hole. Instead, he double bogeyed, he took two extra strokes, and instead became a runner up instead of a champion. And here is what he said to the media. Well, I'm still in shock that I did that. I just can't believe I did that. I am such an idiot. And that's what he said out loud to the media. What was he saying to himself, right? And I want to celebrate an amazing turn of events. Yesterday, Phil Mickelson became the oldest player to ever win a major championship at 50 years old. And he, everybody, all the announcers, he was, everybody else was talking about how he has changed his body and changed his mental game. And he was awesome yesterday. If you didn't get to watch it, Google it. If you don't care about golf, Google it. It was amazing. It was the, you know, no polite golf clapping there. They, they had security around him as he walked down onto the green at 18 because the fans were trying to mob him. It looked like a mosh pit. Anyways, my story about performance anxiety 
is that I was standing in a bathroom, ostensibly changing into my show clothes, but in reality, I was weeping. The realization had dawned on me that there was no way I could compete that day. Anxiety was absolutely crippling me. Every fiber of my body felt the pressure of going out into the show ring. My heart was beating madly as my mind spun outrageous expectations. And my muscles felt tight as drums. And the dread of repeating yesterday's foray into the show ring was a huge weight on my shoulders. And the looped thought was, I can't, I can't, I can't, I can't. I couldn't even articulate it any, what, what exactly I couldn't do. It's just, I can't. Just that resistance. And in that moment of not being able to move forward, I felt failure and humiliation and a deep sense of being a disappointment to someone. And here's the thing. The situation in which I found myself was self-imposed. I'm an adult amateur. I do this for fun, right? And I came to the realization that it was no longer acceptable to impose humiliation or dread upon myself. Now, all these situations that I've shared with you right now are called performance anxiety. And everyone wants to talk about anxiety this, anxiety that, that anxiety is the problem. And I'm here to tell you that anxiety may not be the problem. The problem is actually the self-talk that drives the anxiety over the top, puts it on tilt. The problem is this sort of spiritual, mental, physical, and emotional, and ultimately biochemical process that gets activated within you that you don't know how to combat because you haven't been given the tools. So we're gonna take a little break here. Mike's gonna uh, try to queue up a little um, video, just a little one minute video to start illustrating how all of this works. So he's gonna, while well, he's pulling that up, just notice how you feel as you watch the movie. Okay, so I think that's pulled up. Can you see that, Claire? I cannot. Hmm. Well, it's just a black screen right now. I'm it's just a black play. screen right now. Perfect. <laughs> I'm going to hit play. If this doesn't work, uh, let me know. Okay. Thank you. And so using the chat, tell me what you experienced during that first taxi ride. Make it stop, yes, exactly. <laughs> Distraction. I always get like this when I, when I have to do that. Yeah, really hard to focus, yep. And what about this cringy hyper? Uh huh. It feels like I'm sort of like looking, waiting for something to happen, right? Disturbed, yeah. So what about the second one? What did you experience during the second one? Peace, calm, calmness, yeah. Totally different perspective, yeah. I, I felt 
possibility, you know, like everything, everything seemed like it was like, what's next, right? And so perhaps you noticed, ah, the more chaos, the more you slow down. Very interesting. So some of you may have noticed that the video pictures were exactly the same. The two 30 second clips were exactly the same and the only difference was that background soundtrack. And that background soundtrack, it's the same thing as sort of the emotions and thoughts that are running in the background all the time, whether or not you are aware of them. And this is really just trying to illustrate how our emotions and thoughts that are running automatically in the background, four out of five of which are negative, are influencing our perceptions, our decisions, our relationships. I mean, really nearly everything that's happening in our daily lives. So let's slow down and understand the process of anxiety because it can all sort of go sideways in a split second, right? And whether it's a nagging problem or crippling show-stopping problem, right? Understanding how to interrupt the pattern is what we're gonna talk about today, right? I'm here to, today to actually give you a process and a, and a way that performance coaches understand to break down the processes happening in your body and to help give you the tools of this pattern interruption to truly make a difference. So we're gonna pull up another slide here. And if you want to, again, either put in the number in the, in the chat or which, which one you most identify with, but here are some things that the anxiety might be saying to you, right? And it starts with, this judge hates me hates my horse, hates this type of horse, right? <laughs> Who do I think I am? I don't belong here, right? They must think I'm incompetent. Who exactly they are is always sort of nebulous, but some ubiquitous thinks you're incompetent. There I go, I embarrassed myself again. Why can't I do this? I am such an idiot. Phil Mickelson. Wasted another entry fee. Why can't I ride here like I do at home? I'm just not good enough. And the classic I could have done that better, right? So what, any of those particularly resonant with, with anyone? Or, or give me your favorite. <laughs> oh, my chat is hidden over here. Let's see. Seven and nine, yeah. Yeah, those, la those last few, why can't I ride here like I do at home? Not good enough, could have done it better. Yeah, we're gonna, and we're gonna, we're gonna go into those a little bit more, especially seven, yeah. Yeah. And so how, how is the anxiety showing up in your life, right? Is it overwhelming? Like, are, are you about to, to quit? I mean, do, or do you choke, right? Or is it sort of subtle, just sort of chipping away at your confidence and draining your energy and draining your motivation? Or is it just taking away your enjoyment? Some people find that, that, that their anxiety puts them in the zone to perform well, but it's hellish to get there. Someone mentioned that earlier. So, oh, sorry, my chat is hidden down here. I got to find it. 
someone's talking to me. There we go. Thanks. Take immense tension in your body. Yeah. Yeah. So this time, just, just wave at me. We don't have to get in the chat. Um, what happens when you accomplish something? You know, a it doesn't have to be writing related, you know, a task on the way to some, something bigger in, in life. You know, this task went really well, right? But are you still, you forget what tools you have to work with. Yes, yes. So when you accomplish something and this task went well, do you still think one, I could have, should have done it better, sooner. Finally, I got it done. Are we waving at me? <laughs> and then I like that one myself. Or two, and it can be both. You don't have to choose. Um, you, you might say to yourself, well, what does it matter if I got this done? I'm only halfway there. I can only be proud of myself or celebrate this when I'm done, when, when, when it's perfect, right? And that's what I call the, there's so much more to do, right? And so the inner critic, the king or queen of self-talk only sees all the things you missed and all the ways you fell short of your inner standards, right? And since there is always room for improvement, you can always justify your self-criticism with logic, which makes it very difficult to clear this pattern. So as, I've, as we've been stirring things up, and you guys have been sharing so graciously in the chat, and I really appreciate your vulnerability there, I want you for yourself to write down two or three of these automatic negative thoughts that you are saying to yourself over and over and over again. Now, it may not be a full sentence or a paragraph or anything, but capture that word or phrase that's coming, that comes up for you when you're stuck in this anxiety cul-de-sac. You do not have to share it. If you don't want to, you can if you'd like. And as you're engaging with that a little bit, like, how do you feel? What do you look like? Like, I, I see a lot of you are just going, do we, do we have to go there, <laughs> right? Emotionally, physically, I'm gonna ruin my horse he'll, or he'll hate you. I, thank you so much for sharing that. <sighs> hmm. That's a lot of pressure. And you, you think that you're messing it up for the people that are helping you. Yeah, that you're just going to disappoint somebody else. <laughs> Why does it take me so much longer than others to do this sport? My horse deserves a better rider. I'm sure your horse is well loved and well cared for. Yeah, so all these ways that we're so hard on ourselves that we could have, should have been better or are not there yet, right? You know, I don't want to be a slacker. If I'm not perfect, I'm not trying hard enough. Also, what am I doing wrong, right? Yeah, yeah. Because we are all trained. <laughs> Scrabble would really hurt to fall on. Yeah, we were talking about that the other day. <sighs> yeah. Why can't I ride my horse the way my trainer does? Yeah. Yeah. And so how is all this pressure, all these thoughts and feelings impacting you in your riding or in your life, right? The sort of being demoralized and all those things, maybe I should just give up and trail ride. <laughs> yeah. So the, the impact and the cost of all this, like how long has this been going on? Is this how, how writing has always been for you, right? 
again, I'm assuming most of you, like me, are amateurs and doing this for fun. Right? So Mike, can you unmute yourself for a minute and, and just do a quick role play with me? I forgot to, to give you a heads up on this. Pretend that um, I am coming out of the ring on my horse and you are the first person I see. So what do you say to me? How'd it go? And I say, oh my God, it was a disaster. We missed all of our changes. He bucked through every canter transition and there was zero bend in my half passes. A disaster. And everybody who's ever said that to me coming out of the <laughs> ring, it's like 90% 90, 90 of them are like, you really don't know what you're talking about. That was a very nice ride. <laughs> so what did you... Every once in a while, I will agree with them, but typically uh, the competitor is way harder on themselves than uh, anyone else uh, viewing from afar. And I didn't say one day, one positive thing, right? Nothing positive, right? And so what did you notice uh, sort of about my body language? Like, so you, know, you don't have to answer it. Like, I'm just asking sort of the group and, you know, the it's, it's somewhat rhetorical, but like, it's all dramatic, right? It's all, and my voice is dramatic and my words, like it's a disaster. And I'm defeated, exactly, exactly. And imagine what my poor horse is sensing. You know, he, he, he just tried to do what I asked him to do, right? Over the top frustration, yes, yes, right? And so everything there, is predictable and here's why. We're gonna look at this amazing process of how um, all of these things work together. Yeah, the, the horse is probably feeding off you, right? I let my horse, let down my horse who tried his best. Yep, yep. And, and I do always like to remind people that your horse does not have sort of a pinup calendar of Olympic mounts in his stall going, you know, if my rider could just get her stuff together, <laughs> we could also be Valero, right? Th that is not, they just want to carry it, right? But sometimes it's hard to remember that, right? So we're going to look at this slide that's going to look really complicated at first and I will walk you through it but be, but the visual here is so important so Mike when you can get that up that'll be awesome so I love this I just love this these are the four quadrants and this is the seat this is this contains the secret to your success okay first Four quadrants, physical, that's that's your body, right? Your endurance, your strength, mental, you have attention span, focus, the ability to incorporate multiple points of view. In that emotional sphere, you have, you know, not just a positive outlook, but self-regulation, right? All that drama that came out of the ring, right? That's not doing anybody any good. <laughs> Right? It's just, it's just uh, an outflow of energy that could be possibly rechanneled and then be more useful. The spiritual realm is a little bit challenging to describe, but let me try. It's really there about a commitment to values and a belief in yourself. This is really, I feel, where confidence lives, right? Because if you are centered in yourself and, and what you want to do here, you're centered, right? As soon as you lose that center, you've lost it. And then you start looking for it out here. And it's like, oh, there's, what do they want me to do? What they think I'm incompetent or this, you know, and it, and it gets further and further scattered away from you and, and you're untethered, right? And the lovely, lovely thing and why this is so important in this visual is that each quadrant is affecting the others, right? 
And there is in the middle a sweet spot called coherence. And that is a whole different talk. But for right now, let's walk through how the emotion of anxiety might work, might look in this framework. Okay. So we're going to leave this slide up, but I'm going to recall, remind you of that definition of anxiety, that feeling of worry or nervousness or unease, typically about an imminent event or something with an uncertain outcome, right? So let's start in that green sphere of, of emotion, anxiety. So every emotion has a signature cocktail of biochemicals, neurotransmitters, and hormones that are released when you have that emotion, right? And then the thoughts come in, right? And that's where that unease and anxiety can get out of hand. And, you know, that event with an uncertain outcome gives your brain the opportunity to, as someone pointed out earlier, sort of invent invent negative outcomes, catastrophize, right? Or you can slide into that pattern of criticism, right? Coulda, shoulda, woulda, done it better, right? Or that pattern of there's so much more to do, right? All those thoughts, you would never ever say out loud to a friend, right? And that's why it's so interesting that Phil Nicholson actually called himself an idiot out loud, right? <laughs> and these thoughts have probably been going on most of your life that, you know, 95% of the thoughts you're repeating over and over again. And you take, it, take them as gospel. You believe them, right? And these thoughts then interact with the emotion and can intensify or re-engage the emotion and that, that chemical cocktail release, which res can result in over in that physical manifestation of anxiety, you might have GI distress. You might be dizzy, you might have a headache, a rapid heartbeat, rapid breathing, shallow breathing, a lump in your throat, shortness of breath, ringing in your ears, maybe even blurred vision, right? And then in that spiritual realm, you're like, oh my God, what's happening, right? You lose your belief or your confidence in yourself. You lose your center. And you start looking forward outside of yourself, right? Does anybody have any questions about that? Because this is, this is a, a really foundational piece about how all of these things interact um, together. Anybody's in there? Okay, awesome. So you can um, take that down because now you get to look at my beautiful face. Oops, somebody said, can you explain how spiritual works with it? Yeah, so the spiritual end is, I like to think of that as where, where confidence lives because it's belief. It's a belief in yourself that you um, can, can get something done even if you don't know the exact steps right? You believe that you are going to become a better rider, or you believe that you can learn how to do something, right? You may not know all the steps you need to take, and then, and, but you believe it's possible, right? And then, and if you don't believe that, then you're going, well, am I doing this right? Am I not doing this right? What is she doing over there, right? You, 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 you get further and further from who you are. The, the, I hope that answered that, and we can come back to it again at the again at the end if we need to. Awesome, thanks, Katie. Um, so this these these thoughts and the negative self talk, all that not good enough could have done it better always being true is an energy that is reinforced by society, right? It's reinforced by our schools. It's reinforced by our parents. You know, just think about how we're graded in school. And now we have may have not been in school in a little while, but 
you may have gotten 99% of your answers right. And the only answers that have a big red circle around them are the ones you got wrong. Our culture is very much a you could have done it better, both our society and our sport, right? It's very, very reinforced. And there's also a lot of social, your own horn, right? Even in our own head, we have to be modest and humble. Well, it could have been better. It needed more salt. You know, it, it, we can't just accept the compliment, right? And the problem with it could have been better is that it is always true. You can't argue with it. And to really, really put almost a ridiculous point on it, it is like you are living in a police state in your brain where it says you cannot be proud or celebrate even one little step. You are allowed to enjoy this only when you get all the way there, when you do more, when you start getting things done on time, when you do it perfectly, when you ride the same at the show as you do at home, right? When you do it perfectly. This is so negative and rigid and critical and really absolutely no fun, right? And that's why I'm calling it a police state. And as a result, it's torturing you. It drains your inspiration you, and your motivation. There's no enthusiasm. You're not energized. You're not inspired. You're exhausted. You're defeated, as someone shared in the chat, right? We lose energy and confidence, and we get into overwhelm. So as athletes, you know, as riders, this is one of the biggest obstacles we're up against. We have been trained to look for all the faults and the mistakes so that we can improve, right? And as we look for the mistakes and the faults, that begins to be all that we see. And it really destroys our energy and our enthusiasm and our excitement for our sport and for our desire to practice, right? And, and when we're at practice, you know, when you're, when you're doing that extra Pilates class or doing a little extra cardio at the gym and preparing for, for show season, right? How excited are we about doing all that that we need to improve if we only focus on what went wrong, right? How do you feel about riding in general or even doing something awesome like a pirouette or piaf, right? What might you feel like if you finally succeed at regionals? Will you think it was worth it? And do you see how you're being such a horrible, mean coach to yourself? <laughs> and understanding this is really the first step to unraveling it. And I'm really wanting to call it out. I mean, I, it, it, I'm, I'm pushing it so hard that it's almost to the point of ridiculousness. But that's what's happening, right? Because... You are perfectly normal. You are perfectly human, which means you're not perfect and you never will be, ever, right? Because doing something out of your comfort zone, like learning how to ride or learning how to ride better or spending time with your horse, right, is uncomfortable and anxiety producing. And it's normal to not want to be uncomfortable. However, you know, always being comfortable and safe is not where growth and learning happens, right? Know where you are and the situation you've put yourself in and how much uncomfortable is manageable, right? And you are, it's all possible. You are simply missing the next level of training that elite athletes have to help them get to higher levels of confident collective performance. And that's what I'm here to help you with. I do that kind of next level training for amateur and elite athletes because, because it's the critical component that's missing in your training. So first you need to know that this is changeable, right? That if you want to. We just went through that physical, mental, emotional, and spiritual map that shows how all the pieces are interrelated. And today I'm going to, to share with you a couple pattern interrupts that are going to start you on your way. 
And this is the critical component that is missing for you. And when you have it, you too can experience more joy and excitement and enthusiasm, whether you're a professional or an amateur. My goal for you is to find that joy and enthusiasm, the energy and excitement that comes by engaging in this next level of training. So these two pattern interrupts, okay? Now, the moment I tell you what they are, you are going to think that is too easy. That won't work. I've tried that. That is the sound of resistance to doing something differently. Because as much as you don't like performance anxiety and the, that performance anxiety pattern that you may be in, somehow it has become comfortable for you. And chances are the negative self-talk that puts this normal level of anxiety on tilt that, you, that is totally automatic, right? It's gonna take time and energy and intention to change it, which is why some of my clients choose to work with me for four to six months to fully address all the inner resistance and alter, fully alter the patterns. And I'm gonna share with you these two simple processes of dozens that I use with my clients, which, is, which are gonna help start, literally start changing your brain over time and with these intentionally designed processes, you can rewire your brain, reframe your thoughts, and change the bio. So here's what you're gonna do. After every ride, you need to celebrate. Find two or three things you can celebrate. You have to say it out loud, and you have to sell it, sell it to me. I celebrate feeling a half all today. I celebrate no bucking through my canter transitions. I celebrate remembering my test, right? How is that physiology, my voice, different than it was when Mike asked me how my ride went? Now, some of you are hiding it well, but there are some of you, and I did myself, think that that's stupid. <laughs> there will be resistance. Your whole life, you have been conditioned that the way to get yourself to do more is by daily beatings. Internal, in your head beatings, leading with criticism, cruelty, meanness, instead of happily celebrating every little thing you do like you just cured cancer. there will be resistance. So celebration is the first thing I want you to consider doing. The second thing I want you to consider is gratitude. Thank your horse every time you are with him or her. Feel it and mean it. Now gratitude and celebration are concepts that are out in the world, right? You may have read or heard a TED talk, you know, write down three things you're grateful for every night. But if we remember the four quadrants and how the mental, emotional, spiritual, and physical realms all affect each other, if you are thinking about three things you are grateful for, but not feeling that gratitude, thanks, Mike, the exercise isn't really doing that much for you because it's not changing the biochemicals. The four quadrants framework is unique. It takes simple stuff like gratitude and, and celebration that's out in the world and gives you the basis for how it works. And it sounds simple, right? Sort of too simple. But if it were just about the information, the how, you'd all be doing it and performance anxiety would be a thing of the past. And I want to tell you a little bit more about why it works. Celebration and gratitude are looking for what went right. And let's look at how that affects the mind-body connection. Again, as part of the four quadrants, right? Your inner critic, those thoughts that are negative, 
are silenced or are blustering with nothing to say for once. So the biochemical cocktails associated with self-criticism don't happen, which means the tense muscles, rapid, rapid heart rate, shallow breathing, all those things associated don't happen either, right? Celebration and gratitude are renewing emotions and have a completely different cascade of biochemicals that lead to a more relaxed and ready physical manifestation and mental ma manifestation. You know, if you need to change up your freestyle at the last minute. Um, so let me take you through this in, in one more way. We're gonna come at this from a lot of angles. So I invite you to just casually sort of sit, um, sit up a little straighter and at the same time, make yourself a little more comfortable and focus your attention and your breathing on your heart or chest area. And imagine, well, and you can close your eyes if you'd like, that your breath is flowing in and out of your heart area, breathing a little slower and deeper than usual. You can inhale for a five count and exhale for a five count. And as you settle into that breathing for the next few breaths, in for five and out for five, keeping your attention on your heart and chest area. And as you continue breathing, attempt to feel how much you appreciate your horse and the time you get to spend with him or her. There you go, just breathe in and feel that appreciation. What do you enjoy most about riding? And as you continue your focused breathing, feel that appreciation. Keep breathing in for five and out for five and feeling that appreciation. Stay focused on the heart area as you do your best to feel what you value most about your sport. Then gently ease out and take one more deep controlled breath. You can open your eyes. And congratulations, you just performed one of the many processes my athletes learn and use to develop a competitive advantage. And it's pretty simple, right? And if you can imagine starting each day that way. And, and how do you feel? Just type in, your ch type in the chat particularly after I, I've been mucking around with, with, uh, with all your anxiety <laughs> previously. Blessed, yeah. Appreciation, yeah. Awesome. Relaxed, great. Understand all your thoughts. Cool. Happy. Yeah, relax, reminded you why you love horses and riding, right? That's where you need to be, right? Yeah. So when you can retrain your brain to celebrate and be appreciative, right? Instead of listening to those automatic negative thoughts of your inner critic, your whole mind-body system gets rewired. And that's the concept known as neuroplasticity, you know, depending on how, how into all this stuff you are. Um, and it moves you away from this ruthless pattern of criticism, the inner critic's ability to see all the things you missed and all the ways you felt short. And the volume of your inner critic gets turned down and you're able to be excited and enthusiastic and, and energized about your goals. 
And you're going to be having way more fun because by definition, by the very nature of celebrating, you're, you're happy. You're happier, right? It means you're not soldiering on or overworking because you're retraining and wire, rewiring yourself to stop and celebrate. So this is what I want to offer you. We've talked about a lot of things tonight. Um, and performance anxiety has been a part of your life. or And maybe in a, in a really big way, like for me, where it stopped my, my, my competitive career. Or at least keeping you from the enthusiasm, joy, and excitement of, of your sport, right? And, and whether it sounds like, who do I think I am? I don't belong here, or they must think I'm incompetent, or why can't I do this? I'm such an idiot. It really comes down to this critical component that's missing in your training, the management of the four quadrants. We talked about a big pattern interrupt today, you know, how retraining your brain to celebrate can neutralize self-talk's ability to put anxiety on tilt. And this is just one of the dozens of processes my clients learn to perform. And this is just the beginning, the tip of the iceberg um, of building a foundation for optimizing your performance using the four quadrants. Now, when we did that breathing appreciation exercise, whether you felt it deeply, you, if you felt it deeply, you are going to really enjoy this work. If you were thinking gratitude schmatitude or were having trouble breathing through your heart, it just means that there's different work to be done, right? And so that you can get a full picture of what might be possible for when you train as an elite athlete, I wanna offer you the opportunity to sit down with me one-on-one -on -one to get some clarity on where you might like more joy, enthusiasm, and excitement in your, in your riding. We'll do a full And this is a completely complimentary conversation. I'm just so excited about sharing this work with people. And we'll take everything from today and map out and get a clear picture on where your performance anxiety happens, what it's saying, how it shows up, where it's coming from. And we'll look at what's in the way and what other processes in managing the four quadrants might help you specifically. And I'll evaluate and recommend what your best next steps might be. And Mike is going to put in the chat a link to my calendar to to book that 30 minute call. Um, and I'm happy to take questions as well. So if there's any questions, you can type them into the chat and we will uh, read them off. And I'm sure Claire will do her best to answer them. And actually, we could probably uh, unmute if you uh, if it's easier to talk than type. Uh, go ahead and unmute yourself and ask Claire a question. <clears throat> so I'll get started, Claire. Uh, we've talked about this before. Um, I am. I've never had performance anxiety ever in going into the show ring. Uh, always feel uh, like the complete opposite of all those nine example phrases okay. that you said. Um, but like I typed in the chat, as soon as I walk my horse outside of our like indoor arena uh, across the gravel, um, that's where it all starts for me. Um, that feeling of this horse uh, always feels like he's going to explode. Um, I did, really don't want to feel fall off on this concrete or that gravel. Uh, never have fallen off of this horse. I did break my pinky uh, a week ago. Um, outside of that, uh, the horse has never done anything to hurt me. Um, but I think performance anxiety can manifest itself with other triggers besides just the show arena. Yep. Um, so that's my example. And I imagine there are other people who have uh, similar patterns. Um, do the same processes uh, tend to work in those situations? Absolutely, absolutely. 
Yeah. Because whatever that is that is making you concerned about the gravel is impinging on, is, is dumping a, a, a slew of chemical biochemicals into your body, right? That is probably making the situation worse, right? And what we want to do is, is re hijack your brain to be dumping more positive things into, into your physical body. Right. And, and, uh, that's, that is the very basic way of thinking about it, but to, um, because it's eating the joy that you have for, for the time you spend with Eddie. Right. And only outdoors. Only well, the, other, the other thing, the other, the other reality is there is a close relationship between performance anxiety and fear. Um, and the, a lot of the biochemical reactions are very similar. And we've talked about the fact that in our sport, many of us are no longer 20 year olds and we don't bounce like we used to. And so when we see someone get bucked off at a horse show or we see a horse bucking, we can't help but feel that maybe that is gonna to happen to us. And then, you know, so I think those two things, performance, anxiety, and fear are very, very close. And it's, uh, it's, it's a real issue that is difficult to deal with, but many people have these problems. Yeah. And Michelle, Michelle was saying that she rides a reactive horse and, and knows what it feels like to get dumped. And then it becomes sort of a self-fulfilling prophecy. I have a question about control. Okay. My, my, in my career, uh, it's it been being a troubleshooter for other people and making helping them put their best foot forward. And when it comes to me and being in a horse show, I, it's hard for me to stop being that troubleshooter. And I think that's creating some so some problems with anxiety that I'm not even aware of there sometimes. I have a horse that's a perfect gentleman. He's still a horse and will do some unpredictable things. But um, I'm having trouble letting go of the control that I'm normally keeping in my day-to-day -day work. Right. So that's, that's what's so interesting about this is, is that... Um, most people associate performance anxiety with a competitive situation, right? With the show ring, right? But as Mike was saying, and it's what you, and part of what you're saying, and and what Ken's saying about fear is that it, it this the the anxiety on tilt, whether it's about performance directly or not, that is can all be assisted with this work, right? Most people are. Um, many people are not motivated to do something about it until they want to show or perform in some way, right? They just sort of suck it up or deal with it or whatever, right? And even this conversation and understanding how it's coming up for you is a really awesome first, first place to be. Do we have any other questions? I'll share one anecdote. Uh, a few years ago, I was with a, one of the large barns here at a show. I wasn't riding, but I was kind of helping. Um, there was a teenage girl who was just absolutely gripped that morning with that anxiety of the fear. She could not, uh, she couldn't curry comb her horse. It was just eating her alive. And um, being relatively calm about shows, uh, I started to talk her through the process. And um, in a couple of minutes, I realized that she wasn't even riding her horse that day. <laughs> there was a professional who was coming <laughs> to ride her horse in the show, uh, but she was so wound up. This horse was giving all the same reactions as, <laughs> as if uh, she was the rider in the saddle. and. 
Um, it, I'd never seen anything like that. Um, so it doesn't even have to affect the person who's actively in the ring. And I was talking to a, a young professional the other the other day at Harmony, and she said, you know, riding client horses, no problem. Riding my own horse, I'm very anxious, right? It shows up it, 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 and figuring out where that comes from and what the what the triggers are around it are, you know, then you can go after it. I have a question. So when you're mid-ride and you get all anxious and you don't know what to do, what do you suggest when you're just like in the middle of the ride and you don't want to stop and get off or like you're in the middle of a lesson and you just don't want to like, you can't get off obviously, but you want to overcome it and still have the good rest of the ride. How would you suggest going through that? Right. So are you talking about in a lesson or at in a show situation? Both. Both. They're a little bit different, right? Because in a show situation, really, you do want to finish your tests as a general rule. Say, um, say you have gone off course. This happened to me when I wrote my first uh, my first uh, FEI test. Okay, I messed up my pattern, and the, the the judge rang the bell. And so, what happens when the judge rings the bell? Right? It's it's like DefCon four, right? It's <laughs> like, what have I done? I don't even know what I did wrong, right? I started walking back toward the judge. She explained what I had done wrong. And there, there is, is a, um, there's a, a really cool eye movement that can release things. And I used that technique because there's a lot of things that people ask you to do that are not possible to do on a horse, right? Your hands are busy, you know, breathing for 30 seconds is not possible sometimes, you know, it's, it's, it's gotta be something quick and easy, right? So um, there's a, an eye movement that you can do. So you keep your chin straight and you just put your eyes, um, I'm sorry, I will tell you, your eyes are gonna go down right and just say release because I know the screens are backwards or whatever. So your eyes down right release. And that should release whatever that mistake was, whatever that DEFCON 4 was, whatever, right? And instead of all your thoughts being over here and you're like, I don't even know where I'm supposed to go next, you can go, oh, you know, this foot goes in front of this foot, this foot goes in front of that foot, right? It, it, it slows everything back down because so often it just gets so scattered and so fast. So that's that's another little little tip for today. And you can do that during a lesson, but it's really handy it, it, um, in the show ring. Thank you. You're very welcome. I would say in the lesson, talk to your trainer. Yeah. Don't don't go through it and, and maintain that anxiety if you have a concern if you're anxious if you you know if you're upset stop and talk to your trainer that's what they're there for okay it's 9 13 are there any more questions well if not I want to uh, give Claire a, a really big thanks. Um, great presentation, good ideas, good suggestions. Um, I know that uh, Mike was going to, uh, I think he did put the, uh, the, uh, the URL up there for connecting with uh, Claire, but also we'll copy that and we will be um, able to send out a, a survey to everybody who's been on the call and we can include that in in there in case anybody has an interest in speaking to Claire and it's very um, generous of you Claire thank you so much for making this offer I know it's uh, something you're passionate about something you do for a living but I feel it's uh, very generous of you to make that offer to our members so thank you so much I'm delighted to have been here thank you so much for coming Oh, my pleasure. Mike, any uh, last minute comments on your side? I yeah, just want to say thank you to the Education Committee. Thank you, Claire. Um, 
We have a bunch of stuff going on this summer. Uh, entries are still open for the Indie Classic for like the next uh, about week, I believe. Um, Indie Classic is the second weekend in June. After that, there's the July schooling show, um, Indie Festival, another rated show, and then the write-offs are in September. Along the way, we've got several more education uh, topics like this one. Um, one big one that we're getting close to announcing. And um, I think we've got an in-person uh, clinic with uh, Jeff Moore coming up in a couple weeks. So uh, Indy, indianadressage.org is our website and uh, lots of stuff on the calendar right now. So we'd love to have you um, at our shows, our clinics, our educational opportunities. And um, we just thank you all for participating. Yep, and pay attention to uh, the IDS uh, Facebook page because a lot of good information is transmitted there as well. Okay, right. thank you everybody, appreciate it. Thanks, Claire. Thanks everybody, good night. Good night.